The first category of theories based on a territorial approach raises a number of problems. Firstly, the notion of self-executing rule only belongs to the law of treaties. Admittedly, one could argue that customary IHL directly applies to armed groups, since customary law applies not only to states and international organizations, but also to any other subject of international law. However, this is based on two controversial claims. First, that customary law binds all subjects of international law, and second, that armed groups are subjects of international law. More fundamentally, any theory which makes the binding nature of IHL for armed groups dependent upon the commitments made by the states, against which or in which they are fighting, is likely to lack effectiveness. It raises a serious problem of compliance. It is easy to understand that rebels will hardly ever be ready to comply with IHL rules if they are told that they are required to do so because these rules are binding upon the state against which they are fighting. Such a reaction is clearly comprehensible, since they never took part into the formation of such a rules and obviously tend to consider the whole law of the contested state as illegitimate and therefore reject it. Such a situation already occurred in practice. For example, in the Vietnamese War, the National Liberation Front for South Vietnam opposed the RCRC assertion that it was bound by IHL by arguing that it was not obliged by treaties which had been ratified by other entities than itself. But one could refute this criticism by arguing that it confuses the question of the establishment of legal obligations with the question of compliance with such obligations. This position would nevertheless be founded on a very strict positivist attitude, which is far from satisfying. In that respect, the theories of the second category, which infer the binding nature of IHL upon armed groups from the consent or practice of these groups, have the advantage of ensuring better compliance with IHL by those groups. Actors who have agreed to be bound by the law are less likely to violate it. Those theories increase the ownership by the armed groups of their IHL obligations. However, they are problematic in several respects. First, they imply not only recognizing an international legal personality to armed groups, which is controversial, but also implies attributing them the state-like capacity to make international law, which is even more controversial. More fundamentally, these theories mean that IHL would only be binding upon the armed groups who have given their express or implicit consent, and only to the extent of such a consent. This runs counter the well-established view that all harm groups are bound by the IHL norms applicable to them.